Hey rail fans, in this video I'm going to tell you why I ditched my Digitrax decoders. I'm also going to show you how I power cleaned my locomotive trucks and I'm going to tell you what automatic transmission fluid and no aux ID have in common and I'm going to tell you why this is the grand finale. All that's coming up right now. Hey, welcome to my hobby room and to the Brownsmith Railroad. Like I said, I had to ditch my Digitrax decoders um, and I'm going to show you why, but First of all, let me just say this, Digitrax makes some good products. So I'm not slamming Digitrax with what you're about to see, but I have just found that my TCS, Train Control System decoders, do a better job on my railroad. Uh, the difference between the two, well, we're gonna see that in a minute, but price-wise, it's been my um, experience that a Digitrax decoder is about half the price of a TCS decoder. And maybe in this video, we'll figure out why. To get started, let me take you to a scene right over there that I call Riley and show you what I'm dealing with. Okay, so welcome to a little scene here that I call Riley. Now this is left over from my old layout back when I thought steep grades were all the rage. <laughs> and I discovered trains don't like grades. <laughs> Took me five years to figure that out, but trains don't like grades. Um, so anyway, this is left over from back then. Now it's a, it's a short span and it's just a 2% grade, but it, eh, it gets a little above 2% here and there. But the good news is it's a short uh, span of track. So I'm not pulling an entire train up a 2% grade. I am pulling a, a portion of the train up there. And then what you're gonna see is the train that I'm using for this demonstration is the heaviest train I have. It's a stack train. All the cars are metal and there's plenty of them. Anyway, let me show you what I'm dealing with. Okay, so at the head of my first consist, I've got a Cato SD70 ACE, road number 8574. I've also got a Cato EMD SDP40, road number 5267. Now, both of these locomotives have TCS decoders inside of them. And to make sure this is a fair demonstration, I went through and reset those two decoders to their factory defaults. All I did was put in the road number, and then minimum, maximum, and uh, the mid speed on the speed steps. So let's see what happens with those two decoders pulling that massive train up this hill. You can see here how it just pulls that train right up the hill. Um, and I, it does that time and time and time again. The only time it might slow down is if for some reason the track's a little bit dirty. And I just clean that up and then, woo, it just rolls right along. Now, let me show you what happens with two similar locomotives that have Digitrax decoders inside of them. Our second train is headed up by a Cato ES44 AC, road number 5785, and a Cato EMD SD70 ACE, road number 8400. Now, keep in mind, these both have Digitrax controllers in them. And again, I reset them to factory defaults, except for road number and speeds and stuff. Now, let me show you what happens with the same train and very similar locomotives when we come up this grade. Now look at that, it barely gets started up the grade. Matter of fact, oftentimes I can get a little further, but then I gotta push it with my fingers to get it to go all the way. And that takes all the fun right out of it, baby. Now, before you start laying into me about reprogramming the decoders, understand I have done back EMF modifications. I have done speed adjustments. I have done speed matching. I have done everything I can think about, all kinds of research on the internet for how to make those work. And they just don't work. But now here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take those same two locomotives, I'm gonna put in a TCS decoder and pull that same train in. Let me show you what happens. You see that? It just comes right up that grade and it does it time and time again. I'll run loops ad nauseum with that train and it always comes up the grade. And I think I've narrowed it down to why the Digitrax decoders didn't do a great job and the TCS ones do. And I think it's the back EMF. I'm not exactly certain what that is, but I have an understanding of the concept. So let me just give you a, a brief discourse on that. Okay. Back EMF basically 
your decoder will sense the speed you're trying to go, sense the speed the train is actually going, and increase power so that it continues to go at roughly that same speed. It should work uphill and downhill. I've had mixed results with it. But the inherent back EMF in the TCS decoders and the Digitrax decoders, the TCS is some kind of way it works better. That's the only difference I made, or only change I made to these locomotives to make this work. So again, I'm not dissing Digitrax decoders because I've flat ground and stuff and they're cheaper and you know, Digitrax, woo, they make all kinds of stuff. But uh, if you're like me and you got some steep grades, trying to figure out why your trains won't go up there, some will, some won't, think about the decoders. Well, anyway, there's that. Now let me show you how I deep cleaned, power cleaned my locomotive trucks. To clean my trucks, first thing I did, of course, was take them out of the locomotives. And uh, I didn't really know how to do that because I have a history of killing locomotives when I take them apart. So I watched a video over on Mike Pfeiffer's channel, Pfeiffer Hobby Supply. I'll put a link in the description. Uh, he's got some good stuff on how to do this. Anyway, I went into the hobby sink and I got the water nice and hot. Then I took and I squirted a little bit of Dawn dishwashing soap down in there because this stuff's got a little built-in degreaser, a mild degreaser inside of it. Then I dumped the trucks in, agitated it just a little bit, and then I set it off on the back of the sink for about 20 minutes. After that 20 minutes, I used a sieve and I poured everything through the sieve so I didn't lose any parts down the drain. Then I turned the water on full bore and I found that holding at the bottom of the sink, it just allows more power in the water to hit those trucks. Once the trucks were dried off, I put just one drop of this oil on there because they're gears and they need to be lubricated, but just one drop and worked it through there. If I put on too much, it's gonna start picking up dirt and scenery and whatever else. Then I just put the trucks back into the locomotives and I gotta tell you, they run great. Okay, let's talk about what this and this have in common. Both of them are an oily, greasy like substance. Both of them are conductive. Both of them are supposed to eliminate track cleaning forever. And um, in both cases, they uh, attract dust like a magnet attracts iron. And in both cases, I was dumb enough to put this crap on my track. Now listen, before we get all excited and start blowing up the comments here, I know a lot of you have had success with no ox ID, okay? That's why I tried it. Here's the problem. I haven't been able to run my trains enough because I've been working in here to keep the track clean. And that's one of my mantras. You wanna keep your track clean? Run your trains. They, it stays clean. Um, it's not just me saying so. Look what Marklin of Sweden has to say. Before getting started on track cleaning and materials and methods, how to do this, I would like to say that the number one prevention method in order to avoid track cleaning is to run trains. Yes. If you run your trains like once per week, you will never ever need to clean your tracks. That's a fact. See that? He's in agreement. <laughs> Man, he can't be wrong. He's got some good stuff over there. There's a link to his video in the description. So uh, here's the thing. I put it on like the videos say you do. I just dabbed it on with my finger and then I gently wiped it all over my track. I thought I had a microscopic coating on there. Well, I don't have a microscope, so I don't know for sure. But what I do know for sure is this. I ran my trains and they ran like, whoa, right out of the chute. I'm like, this stuff is magic, baby. And then it got worse. And then it got worse to the point where I have now spent about eight hours um, cleaning this stuff off my track. For all I know, there's still a microscopic layer. I don't know. But look at these pads. These are lint-free wipes that after supposedly my track was clean, I went back over with these and wiped it off. Look at all the black stuff on these pads. Where's that coming from? It's not supposed to be there. I, I, I thought I had the solution. Look at these pads from my track cleaning car. Pad after pad after pad. So listen, if you guys dig the Noox ID and it works great for you, great, it works great for you. But I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't work great on my railroad. And so I believe I've cleaned it all off. Actually, I interrupted track cleaning to make this video. Um, there's still more cleaning to do. So anyway, that's my take on it. Uh, like I said, put it down in the comments uh, if you got some other take on it. But for now, let me bring it back over here. Let's talk about why this is the grand finale. Okay, so a few years ago, I started making YouTube videos about things I was doing on my model railroad. Matter of fact, the first model railroad I had was in my old house. And then I built 
a big one here, and then I tore it out and built this one. And in that amount of time, friends, I have shown you every technique that I have. We have covered laying track, ballasting track, painting scenery, installing scenery, uh, water effects. We've covered so much. There really is nothing new to show you on my model railroad as far as techniques go. So I think for now, what I'm going to be doing is continuing to play with my railroad because I love it, baby. But uh, rather than just making up stuff to make a video about, um, I could do a book review. I could do a product review, but that's, that's not a regular guy thing. That's a, let someone else do that. I'm not here to invent stuff just to get views on YouTube. So I've got some ideas for some other kinds of things that I'm going to work on on this channel. And uh, some of that might be railroad related. Some of it won't be railroad related, but we're calling this the grand finale. <laughs> so the reason is, is because I'm, I'm done with that, but I do want to show you some of the stuff that I've been working on since the last time we were together. So let's move back over to the other side. Let me show you a little town I call Bentleyville. Hey, welcome to Bentleyville. It hangs off the Bentleyville yard. One of the things I love about this scene is I've got a single track that serves three industries. Now, what I've tried to do throughout the railroad is come up with different configurations for how tracks serve industries to give me some different opportunities, some different challenges for switching operations. And I've achieved that here. Let's take a look at the first industry. This is a fertilizer distribution facility. It takes bags of fertilizer out box cars, puts them in a little warehouse, puts them on trucks and ships it off to the ag areas. This was a laser cut kit that I assembled and painted and weathered and whatnot, stuff you've seen me do before. But one of the things is I've put this wrought iron fence around it just to sort of secure the area. But you'll see as we move forward, all three industries have a different kind of fence. I did that to mix it up a little bit, add some variety. They're all weathered a little differently. Um, I really like the way that came out. This next industry, I'm not really certain what it is at this point. I think it's something to do with small parts or small tools. Comes in off box cars and gets sent away on trucks. The structure itself is just parts left over from other kits that I sort of bashed together to put this together. Um, it might be a co-op facility, frankly, when it's done because of all the different freight doors. Maybe there's three different tenants in there. I don't know. But again, you can see I used a chain link fence around it with barbed wire on the top, weathered a little differently than what I did before. This next industry is a Walther's kit. It's Vulcan Manufacturing. And I really like the way it came together. I did do a little modification here and there, and I added some LED lighting to it. I really like the way the lighting uh, comes through the windows and then it, it lights up uh, under the canopy. This manufacturing plant receives shredded metal that I'm calling unobtainium because I have no idea what metal it is yet. Uh, it takes it out of the gons and then puts it in these bins right here, processes it, and then ships it back out. Uh, I don't know, on flat cars, box cars. I haven't quite figured out what the finished product is yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, you see, I also got a tanker car right there. That is fuel oil that comes in and gets pumped into this facility in the back that they use to keep the furnace going. Now, I suppose that could be natural gas or something else, but I really like the extra detail and it gives me one more opportunity to switch out cars. Taking in the whole scene, if you don't look too close, it looks pretty good. Now let's go look at something that I call Shit's Creek. So I wanted to put a water effect in on the railroad now this big wide open space. So one night out of the blue, I told my wife I want to put in a creek and she said, well, you might as well call it Shit's Creek. Have you guys seen that show? That's an amazing show, it's so funny. Uh, as an homage to the show, take a look at this. That is the sign that uh, Roland and Johnny have a problem with uh, right outside of town. I was able to make that and put those characters in. I really like the way it turned out. It's a lot of fun. To put this in, I just cut out the plywood that was there, lowered it a bit, and then put in some styrofoam and then uh, hit all that with joint compound and painted it. Stuff you've seen me do before. One of the things I was trying to get done is right here by the creek, I wanted to be really lush, really green, so I put in a whole bunch of trees. There's a little over 100 trees right there. And shrubbery and bushes and hedges and stuff like that. It really came out great. I'm very happy with it. Also put in a road, a little two lane road. That's just basically foam core that I put together and then covered it very lightly with joint compound, painted it, used a, uh, a fine point sharpie to make some cracks 
and then put the striping on there. Put some details in like the, uh, the arrows here at the turn and stuff. And you know, I gotta tell you, I really love watching my train run behind that scene. Very proud of the way that turned out. Now, let me show you one more thing. It's the town of Brownsville. So this is a scene that I call Brownsville. It's got two rail served industries, plus it's got a little town in the front that is somewhat kit bashed, somewhat kit built. Way over here on the right, I've got a Walther's power plant that's not quite done yet, but um, I needed a place to put my coal cars for my old layout. And so what I'm gonna do is bring in coal from my interchange track over here, dump it, and then send them back to the interchange track. That shed you see hanging off the side, that is something that's left over from my old Portsmouth scene, which used to be on my bottom deck. You can see that I've started working on the roads and stuff. I've still got to do some weathering on that. I've got a power distribution kit that I'm gonna figure out a way to install in there at some point, and basically give my coal car something to do rather than just chucking them. Moving way over to the left, this is my plastics manufacturing facility. I don't know what kind of plastic, but it takes loads in through hoppers and boxcars, does something in the plant, and spits it back into hoppers to ship off to my interchange track. Interesting thing about this, this used to be my concrete manufacturing facility on the old layout, which was a kit bash. Well, I took that and then I kit bashed it again into what you see here. You can see I've still got to go back and fix the scenery. I got a little crazy with it and it didn't come out quite right, but uh, I'm, I'm working on that. Just in front of all of that is the actual town of Brownsville. I took a couple of Walther's Merchant Row kits and spliced them together to make one long one. And then I primered all of that and then I had to go through it hand paint all of the surfaces. I wasn't really thrilled about that because hand painting always looks like hand painting. But from a distance, it looks like weathering. If you get up close, well, it didn't look so great. But anyway, I'm pretty happy with the way it came out. Just in front of that merchant row is the tail end of another merchant row that I just made from some pieces that were left over. You can see I painted the back of it black. Someday when I put my fascia in, that'll all made up together and the fascia is gonna be black. And so I think that'll tie in pretty nice. And then just to the left of that, this is a state line uh, store. I forgot what it's called, but I built it the way it's uh, supposed to be built. And then I glued on a warehouse to the back of it, also the back of it, it's painted black. You can see I've got to weather the road, I gotta put in some striping. And frankly, in all these scenes, what's missing are people. Either this is post-apocalyptic, or I'm gonna need a bunch of people. So I tend to get on that here in the next, I don't know, few months, whenever I get around to it, as money provides and time provides. Well, Rail fans, there you go. That's what I've been working on. Uh, since the last time we were together. Got a lot of work done. And I do most of this after working on the weekends just to relax and unwind. And um, I'm pretty happy with some of the results. Clearly more to do. I got to put in some signs and some people and a bunch of details and things of that nature. Now, I just want to tell you before I let you go, just because I'm saying that I'm done showing you videos on this railroad does not mean I'm done making videos. Um, eh, some of it's going to be as time allows, but... Um, there's so many other projects that I want to work on that will incorporate some of these techniques, but I'll tell you this, my commitment to you, especially those of you who have been with me for the last five years, if you saw something in any of these scenes that you think you'd like to see how I did it, um, I believe in giving the viewers what they want. Just let me know in the comments. We can start a list. Maybe I can incorporate some of that into some future projects, but I got to tell you, thanks so much for being with me for all this time. Thanks for watching this video. And until I see you again, my name is Steve Brown and thanks for watching.